Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for SAS Innovate 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Dave Vellante, my co-host, co-founder, as well as he runs theCUBE Research. As we wind down two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, we got the best for last, we got the star of the show, Udu, he's a VP of Applied AI and Modeling for SAS, the key player in a lot of the AI that's going on in their strategy, what's under the hood, um, and the models, all really, 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 I think one of the most important things here is the introduction of the model. So, great to have you back, good to see you. Good Thanks to see you, We're all going to get the energy this last segment, we're going to amp it up. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, how you feeling? I'm excited, but I'm also a little bit exhausted because there was a lot of interest at this event about the announcements we made, you know, releasing models as a product. And this of course, you know, a major step in my mind forward for us as a company and the industry, if I may say. So I, gotta, I, I want to just give everyone a quick reset. You guys introduced the SaaS, you got the three things, you know, productivity, performance, trust, three pillars. You introduced the concept that there's buyers of, 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 of AI, users of AI, buyers of solutions, basically I'm using AI, and then you got the people who build AI, there are certain Correct. companies that have to get the hardcore machine learning, hardcore ops, hardcore AI, and then you got the subscribers of model, people who are going to use models into the stuff, whether they're building AI or, or using it. That's, I think, the first company other than OpenAI that had that little library or marketplace you guys are bringing SaaS models that you guys have vetted into one place, okay, in use cases that are known and well understood, applying generative AI to fraud. What is, take us through what that is, because yeah. with doing that, people in the cube have come in and said it from this show, that gives you some advantages. Can you yeah. put governance around it? Take, take us through what is actually in that model package that people can subscribe to. Take us through it. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, you, you basically gave a wonderful overview of uh, what we are doing already. The point is that, you know, we've been in the market for a, a long time, right? You know, almost 50 years. Over this 50 years, we solved a lot of individual customer problems. You know, very specific, unique challenges of customers, mostly using our consulting resources, right? And, and now we are basically saying, you know, why don't we take all that IP which we gained over the years, combine it with the algorithms which we deliver and package that up as a model package which then can be easily deployed and um, you know, put into production systems because it's all sitting in a container and it's basically you know, accessible through APIs. So you were wondering about what's inside of that container. Well, obviously it's the logic, right? You know, there is some math, there is some way how we solve these problems. But on top of that, we also have metadata about the models. So we also launched this concept of a model card. So the model will also say, you know, I have these ingredients, you know, these KPIs, which can then be fed into a model card. And to make things even more exciting, we also include prompts, you know, so that when you deploy the model, you can have actually a discussion with the model. So you can say, what can you do? And the model will say, I'm a model for fraud detection. These are the questions which you can ask me. And we, we talked a little bit about, you know, you said, you actually made the comment that you wished we heard more about democratization um, of AI. But in a lot of ways, when you're offering these out of the box AI models, you're dramatically lowering the technical expertise required to exploit them. And that is a form of democratization. Well, well I mean, I, I, before you answer, I wanted to say for clarity. I challenged the democratization on the opening keynote because the focus was on the developer side of it, so the data science developer piece of it, mm. so they had that red cube. You think the understated... No, no the, 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 the VIA workbench is the democratization angle, so they have two things going on here. As is the model, out yes. of the box yes. models. I mean, that, that's, that's democratization, that's bringing new capabilities and faster time to get stuff done or figured out or discovered. Also putting it into hands of people who are not used to use this kind of models. Right. right? So we had this example in the opening session where we worked with a large CPG company and um, you know their business case is that they have several inventories where they can store um, items. Um, once they want to produ uh, use these items in the production line, they will basically pull an inventory out of the warehouses. So the question they have is, well, if a truck driver arrives in the morning 
where should the truck driver go to deliver his or her goods, right? So in the past, you know, the planner would probably pull out a piece of paper <laughs> and say, well, yesterday we determined that there's space. With the model which we are introducing, an optimization algorithm will run behind the scenes, it will take all the constraints into account, and it will then communicate with a truck driver in natural language, please go there, you know, find this person and deliver your goods there. And this is almost like Google Maps, right, isn't yeah. it, right? <laughs> you know, where you're basically yeah. saying, yeah. I want to go from A to B, I don't need to know how the root yeah. calculation is handled behind the scenes, right? I just need the answer to my specific problem. The prompt libraries are critical, and what I, there's a nuanced part of the announcement, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, we'll come back to the models, um, the prompt storage. Because that, that seems innocent on the surface, oh yeah, I got some stored prompts, that's like a canned prompt, but I think where it leads us is more prompts, and ultimately a promptless environment. Right. Where now under the covers, the system can work on your behalf. Is that, am I reading that right? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly the idea, right? That it's more driven, you know, in the communication with the model, right? Rather than a person dreaming up prompts, right? What, what may I say to the LLM, right? Which is, of course, different how we are using LLMs today in our personal lives, right? Where you just go there and you may ask random questions, right? Yeah. The model has a, has a specific charter and a specific task. That's why we, we envision that the first question is like, what can you do for me, right? It's almost like, yeah. you know, but imagine now you have a library of models, right? Yeah. And, you know. And Dave, before you, before yeah. you know, Dave wants to get down, I want one more thing. The other thing I want to point out is that you guys use the word lightweight. Yes. And I want you to explain what that means because we've been saying, we were the first ones to put out the power law of, of models a year ago. Uh, first research firm to do that, we were right. A little self-congratulatory, humble brag. <laughs> um, of course, we're usually right most of the time. Um, but the power law, our thesis was, the large language got all the attention, but the value was in the specialty models where the IP was. A model can be small, but high, high octane model, very powerful. 100%. And, and, and so that, that happened. That's what you guys are basically pointing out here. So the payment fraud detection, the welfare fraud detection, document vision, all digital assistance. You guys have data and pre-canned, I won't bad word, but pre-packaged the models for use. Spot in well-known use cases. And the, the lightweight angle comes that, you know, we want to be able to plug in eventually into any IT system. I mean, obviously, initially it will be um, designed for the SaaS user base, right, and we will target our own market, but a model can potentially run even outside of the SaaS ecosystem, right, because it's mass, it's large language model prompts, you know, it's metadata, so we can even imagine that you can basically deploy our containers, let's say, inside of a database vendor, right? And in fact, we are already doing some experiments there that, you know, with the more modern database vendors that we can say, why don't we put the container inside of your ecosystem so there's no data movement, right? And then basically it's all happening inside of the database. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally no data sense. movement yeah. got my attention. Now, I, I want to, <laughs> you, you mentioned, I think it was in the media briefing that uh, LLMs are actually, foundation models are a small part of the equation here. We, yeah. talk, we were talking earlier about how Llama 3 was just introduced and, or announced and, and, and we get excited about these things. But, but so, how are you actually using LLMs and what are the most salient aspects okay. of these models? So, two things about that. So, first of all, currently we are using LLMs mostly for the interaction with the model. The model itself basically uses whatever kind of algorithm we believe is appropriate. Because there, there is this misconception that you can all of a sudden use LLMs for Everything. any problem <laughs> of the world, right? And it's very interesting to see that when we have discussions with customers about their use cases for LLMs, the first reaction is more almost always, but that's an optimization problem, or this is a forecasting problem. Why don't you use the appropriate algorithms yeah, for that, right. right? So that's step one, right? But our vision is that we want to be able, and this is more targeted at a use case where you build the model in collaboration with the user. So the LLM will then ask questions in a similar fashion like you would ask questions to a data scientist. Mm -hmm. So it will basically try to determine, you know, what is your business question? You know, in which category of analytics does that fall? And then once it knows that, it will ask questions which will help to construct the model on the fly. 
And this is pretty exciting research yeah. which we are doing. Of Very course, cool. it's not ready yet, right? So this will not be part of the first. So I got to ask you about um, some of the trends we're seeing and, and get your thoughts on it and get your reaction. I mean, that's all of what I love about this market. It's unfolding as we see it in front of us. Um, you guys are doing a good job with it as well. Um, and you're digging ahead and get the products. Cross-modality reasoning is becoming a big topic. And let me explain what I mean by that. You probably know it, but the audience. Reasoning is a hot topic. So prompt response, you get an answer. Prompt and get canned, similarly promptless. Everyone sees that with ChatGPT and other prompts. Reasoning means I got to figure out stuff. Basically solve something, figure, reason it, understand it, the context, all that stuff. So reasoning has become a hot topic. Now when you have images and text, maybe DNA sequencing, I mean, I mean if, it's, if it's not text, it's another mo mo mode. Right, right, so right. multimodal means not just text. Yes. Text is actually easy. Yes. So text is great. And that's why all the use cases are text-based. Images are huge. And you gave a, de a demo today of like what we all see in like old school like government contracts, paper with handwritten stuff on it. There's a lot of that stuff around. That's an image. That's computer vision. So as the modals come in, it's hard to do cross-modal, cross-model modality if it's not all in one place. You're right. smiling because you're like, yeah. you, you agree. I fully and, agree. And the solution yes. is what? Yeah. Put it all in one place, centralize it, or? Federate it. So what's your, what's your, tell us your vision on this because I think if you get this right, you can save a lot of efficiencies and latency yeah. and get time, fast, more time to the value. Yeah. I think we discussed that earlier. You know, in, in my mind, the one thing which separates us as a company from a lot of our competitors out there is that we like to be output driven, right? So we think about the output, the decision first, right? What are we trying to accomplish? And then we think about well, which technology, which mode, you know, from this different universes, text, streaming data, images, is required to address that problem, right? And then we basically build the pyramid bottom-up, so it's a top-down, bottom-up approach, if that makes sense, yes, yeah. right? So eventually, you know, again, you know, we, we want to deliver these models as lightweight containers, and the only thing you need to know are the APIs, which you can use to, you know, input information to the container, and the APIs which will return the information, right? So eventually we want the users just to focus on that. You know, and basically what happens in the guts, well, that's our business, right? That's, that makes sense? Yeah, totally. Yes. And so then governance becomes a big important piece. Oh, wonderful. And, yes, 100%. And, and and you can't get AI right without governance solved first. Yes. And it's you plain. see, this is why we also want to focus initially on our own SaaS ecosystem, because we also have tools like Model Manager, which help us to determine is the model still valid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something which you typically do over time. And the, the thing we are concerned about is what's called model decay. Sure. So basically, the accuracy of the model gets worse and worse and worse, right? The model itself will not know that, of course, right? So we are also thinking about, well, how does this work if we are not in the SaaS ecosystem? So somehow we need to introduce some persistence layer to the model so it can basically store information over time and then it can assess itself you know, how am I doing? Yeah, kind of like observ it's like observability. Yes. For LLM. <laughs> yes. For model. 100%. Yes. Whole other category of observability created in the market. Can I ask you a question about the document vision sure. demo that you put, showed on stage? That was um, awesome. It, it was awesome. My question was, how is it differentiated from some of the things we've seen like in document understanding from, say, some of the RPA vendors? Yes. Is this, is, is it, is this different? Is it, is it new tech? Um, um, capabilities? Or let me say that there are similar offerings in the market. Okay. Right? This is not a unique new offering. What makes this unique is that this is based on our consulting experience. So okay. this is stress-tested technology, right, which we implemented several times for very complex PDF formats. Maybe I should explain what we are doing. So the, the question of the, the uh, of document mission, which it tries to address is, you have unstructured data, maybe in a PDF format, right? And the PDF document is not just text, right? It's all over the place. Handwritten notes, tables, images, you know, maybe some key relationship which you are interested in. And we are using a mix of AI and NLP after we process the PDF document with an OCR service 
and for that we are using Microsoft at this point in time, but it could be any OCR service, to add additional information which we can get out of the document. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the idea is then basically you're turning very unstructured data into structured data. So what is really new in my mind is, this is, and I repeat myself, stress tested, it's working. You know, we have done this many, many times for very complex customer engagements and now we are basically packaging that up to provide it to other customers. So that means higher yields, better outcomes, uh, make Six Sigma for business applications where you wouldn't normally have that level of quality. Yes, okay. that's, that's what I'm thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, makes sense, okay. And so, when does that ship? So, our goal is to release the first models in the first quarter, okay. uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. I see, okay. Right? And, yeah. you know, of course, you know, we want to be, you know, modest in the way how many models we roll out because we want to assess the market as well you know, where should we be heading and what kind of models are required. But our vision is, of course, you know, to scale this up, yeah. right? I always think about this as a model marketplace which yep. we need to introduce, right? Yeah, Soon you're going to have app marketplaces because if developers get their hands on this with VIA Workbench, you're going to start to see a lot of experimentation and then people will accidentally, on purpose, discover things um, through their ease of use of self-service. Here you go. I mean, that is a, I mean, that's the console. That looks like Amazon Web Services 2010. Okay, yeah. spin up some EC2. Now you got cloud compute. You got the models all there. Yeah. That's going to create more developers. Uh, and, and you see also uh, an aspect which we haven't discussed at all is, you know, we are also going after companies who were so far reluctant investing in AI because they feel like, oh, we don't have the people, you know, we don't have the environment, and, and how- We don't want to give our skis and pay all the service. And how show, can we show fast return on investment? Now, with models, you take not much of risk, right? You, you pick one use case, you basically get a quick results because everything is already ready for you, you know, just plug in the container, and then you can basically grow your appetite for more AI while you are actually seeing value. Right, and this is different to how we approached the market before, where we would basically say, well, buyers or builders of AI, you know, you're either, you know, a buyer, where you basically build a ready-made solution from us, or you are a builder, then you have to do these things yourself. Now with models, you don't have to be in the other two categories, right? So, it's interesting because our data is consistent, as we show all, just under 20% of the firms, and this is a Decent sized survey, 18, almost 2,000, say they're not, not pursuing gen AI yeah. um, because it's moving too fast, it's too risky, too complicated, and it hallucinates, we don't trust it, so they say we'll wait. Yes. So but, you're but, addressing. But their, but their experiments are, their experimentation is with their own data. That's why RAG is popular, Yeah. because it's easy to do. These guys, are, they claim they're not doing it. So I reached out to several and said, Are you really not doing anything? Yeah, it's. it's moving too fast and we don't trust it and we're just going to wait. Yeah. So now you can go to them and say, okay, you don't have to wait. <laughs> You've got these pre-built you know, models. <laughs> you must have heard this. <laughs> yes, several times and also a little bit tongue in cheek. They don't even need to know that there's AI right. in the model package, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> because it, the discussion is different, right? Yeah. You know, the discussion is, oh, you got all these PDF files with unstructured data, don't you need it? for reporting or for analysis, even if the analysis is just some yes. yeah. sums and means and whatever, right? We, we help you with that, right? So you see we are lifting the discussion away from the technology discussion. Yeah, yeah it and becomes and invisible to, well, in a way. It's just, it's well, an No, you're providing a service, because I mean, I'm not going to compare SaaS to the hyperscalers or Meta, but if you look at what Meta's doing with Llama 3 right now, what they're essentially have, are doing, this is a genius strategy move for them, and it's similar to what you do, and I'm going to get your reaction to this because I'm going to tie it to something. They're putting in um, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of, in, of investment from a major tech player for developers with Llama. Um, so that is just basically giving developers free open source software and infrastructure to run it on to start. Now, that's hundreds of billions of dollars. You guys are putting $2 billion into our, uh, AI development that you're going to offer to your customers. So in a way, there's a, there's, a, there's a parallel there, right? So we're seeing um, the new branding or brand value in targeting not the tech nerds, per se, 
the Correct. developers who were creating value. Correct. So we're shifting to seeing the entrepreneurial and the innovation people, stars, aren't the hardcore developers. Those stars, they still are, but the new stars, the new rock stars, the new people that are going to give you all fans for, is going to be business people or anyone. 100% agree. Because, because, because now you have a developer using all that infrastructure for Llama 3 with Meta, you're bringing SaaS's DNA to the table. Google Next last week, they're bringing all their AI chops to the table. That's what you guys did. Yeah. And then said, hey, let's put two billion into it and then bring it out to the market. And that's our competitive strategy. That's exactly right. And you, you summarized it very nicely, but I also want to say that as part of our vision, and this will not happen right away, as part of our vision, we want to open that ecosystem also to partners, right? So yeah. we can say, you know, you have the intellectual property, we yeah. have the technology, why don't we go jointly to the market? You know, we as the trusted provider of, of analytics and, and technology, you as the trusted advisor of business know-how, right? You know, that's exactly what we want to do. And then the idea is basically that we could even say, you know, give us yeah. your models and we'll turn it into software behind the scenes. Let me ask well, a question. So, okay. so can I follow up on yeah. that? Because yeah. well, I want to pick up on something you said earlier. You can containerize these models and bring them to data platform platforms. So I can bring the models to the data. Um, and that's part of the vision, or is it you actually have plans to do that in various We are cases? researching that today. Okay, so, so we have concrete discussions with some of the modern database so, so vendors. There's, there's three to, hyperscalers, to make this and there's Databricks, and there's Snowflake. I mean, those yeah. would be the obvious places to go. Um, so, some combination <laughs> of those guys. I read his eyes. Okay. Like, Dave's asking so the then, question, I'm like studying so the then, answer. <laughs> then, <laughs> That's a yes in there. Then, beyond that, <laughs> how do you 10x or maybe even 100x this? Okay, that's what you're talking about now. Correct. The developer. So they get maybe they get a little taste in yeah. one of those you mean, modern data. This, the show floor. This exhibitor, right, the, 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 the ecosystem. Hub. Yes. Because that's you mentioned scale before, because that's yes. how you scale this. That's how we right. want to scale it, yeah. right? And the plan is to first scale it within SaaS, because you know, our current modeling team is is US centric, right? You know, so if we come up with a tax fraud model, as an example, it will work very well for the US market. It won't work for Germany, which has a completely yeah, different tax world. Yeah. So we will basically pull in our consultants from Germany, because you know, SAS is a global company, so we have modelers around the globe and basically say, well, why don't you take our model, adjust it for your market needs, and then we create a specialized German version of the tax fraud model. So, I, I so that's step number one. Yep. Step number two is then the partners, right? And right. basically say, you know, why don't you do that, right? And we become more of the brokers of the models. Right? So you developers know? and partners. I, 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 remember a ServiceNow? Yeah. When we first started doing the ServiceNow shows? Yeah, yeah. Like 2013? It was actually here at the Aria, and it was about the size of an ecosystem. Yeah, And small. then they announced, like the CreatorCon, I think it was called, and they, they started to build a developer platform. It was very sort of raw at first, and then it exploded. Now look at, at ServiceNow. Yeah. Right, and, uh, I and see they take advantage of everything. Similar That's our hope, of course. You know, if you ask me, you know, currently, of course, we are humble and we are nimble with the models, yeah. right? We just released them. I wouldn't be surprised, right, that in five years the models may be even the most important market which we are addressing, yeah. right? If yeah. we get this right, it's a huge lever. It's huge, right? Yeah. Because now we can go literally to every company, regardless of their technology expertise. Yeah. Plug this in. Plug this in, make it happen. Yeah, and then you have the performance side on the platform, and go. the trust and the security and governance built in, and it's smart and intelligent and fast. Here you go. That does a lot of the under under the and hook. And it's a platform to add value on top of it, things that you know, might not necessarily do yourselves. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. And so they can do it, right? Yeah. So they can also shine internally, right? And so okay, coming into focus, that's exciting. Yeah. You know. so, so I have to ask you as a culture, I mean, we, first of all, we love the SaaS culture, it aligns with theCUBE, very strong people, high integrity, work hard, play hard, um, and, and, and are family oriented like you guys are. Now you're going to go public, okay? You don't have to come on the public offering, no you won't. But now you have to build an ecosystem, you have to do things you haven't done before. Mm -hmm. You got to build a different sales strategy, indirect sales, you got to have an ISV partner network, you have to have customer success integrated into that, all new mechanisms. The good news is on the contracting side, you're used to service. Uh, so the product, customer side, revenue, I think that's going to be solid. But the partner, that's going to probably be a big part of the future revenue. 
you got to get that right. Absolutely right. How does, yes. What's it like internally? Are you guys feel like you're comfortable with right there? Are you going to take your time? What's the answer? You know, we accept the challenge, right? <laughs> Good answer. You know, it's, it's, you know, I think Brian Harris said, you know, we are a 47-year-old startup, right? Of course, we are not a startup when it comes to size and, and, and revenue and we mentality. generate. mentality. But the mentality yeah. is like this. And if you look at SaaS like maybe 10 years ago, it's nothing like the SaaS which we talk about today, right? So we had these waves of you know, evolution, let's say, and yeah. you know, now we're basically saying, okay, we are ready for the next challenge, and yeah. there are a lot of darn smart people on our campus, and I'm sure we can figure this well, out. Well, you guys are packaging interesting models as a standalone product, that's the new, new, big news here. Obviously, this is the future of data plus AI. I love that equation that you had, I'll pull it up in my notes here, and then we'll end with this, I thought, I thought it was very clever. Um, data plus AI plus decisions plus outcomes equals learning rate. Here you go. Now, what's interesting is that we debated this, learning equals learning, usually outcomes is the equal part, right? But it's on the wrong side of the, the, the equation, but it's on the other side, it's on the left side. The equals learning rate implies always changing, Here hence the generative. What do you mean, what does that mean? Can you share insight to why you say learning rate because you see it never stopping or is that what's what? You know, it, it's basically also reflecting the maturity of our customer base, right? You know, some of them, even you know, if they have all the ingredients right on the left side, you know, the, the amount of analytics they apply may still be limited to a, a certain areas. So their learning rate may be lower, right? But then, you know, they may challenge themselves and say, we want to become more AI driven and maybe even eventually a completely AI centric company, right? Where AI is a focus area of us as a company, as a corporate strategy. And that's where then the learning rate, of course, you know, increases, right? And then, of course, yeah. I mean, you gentlemen know that much better than me. We live in such volatile <laughs> days, yeah. right? Yes. You know, it's almost yeah. like every day we are waiting for the next thing to happen. Yeah, it's a crazy world place, right now. Right? But we're getting smarter and smarter and smarter as collectively, right? And Correct, and yes. Nobody wants to go backwards. No, I hope so. <laughs> Thank right. you for coming out, dude. Great to see you, congratulations. As we wind down, our model decay is kicking in <laughs> as, we, as we try to finish strong. Very good. Final question <laughs> for you to close us out. Next year, we're sitting down talking. What will, where will we be? What will we be talking about then? Okay, so my expectation for our team is to be ready to show success stories for the modeling pieces, right? So I want customers to go on stage and basically prove that what we talked about now is real, right? And of course, we are all excited about this <laughs> and we put a lot of energy right. into this now. But the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah. Eventually, it's not us who decide success. Yeah. It's our customers. And I want customers to stand up maybe on the main stage and yeah. say, yeah. the stuff they talked about last year, it saved us yeah. X million dollars. And guess what? We implemented it in two days. Well, right? the Georgia Pacific example was very, yeah. very that strong. That was solid. So if you can show many, many more of those applied to the I models. So. Wow, that's yeah. so More much. production workloads. We're, our, our team said at the beginning of the year, this year we're looking to score people up on their AI chops by the, by the judgment of the performance. And the, and the KPI for us is how many production workloads are in, how many AI workloads are in production? Here you go. And that's going to be the beginning. And then, then you look at, okay, what's happening there? So if it's not in production, that's still cool, but it ain't the top of the mountain. That's exactly right. That's where we're looking at it. That's exactly right. It was great to have agree. you on. No, thank great. you so much Thanks for having Thanks for helping us here. wrap up the show here at SAS Innovate. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. For the whole team, the whole crew here, Brendan, Noah, Rob, and the team, thanks for all your support, and thanks for watching, and go to thecube.net for all the videos, obviously this is the real time here, and siliconangle.com, for John Furrier, with Dave Vellante, I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.